We traveled all the way to France and visited eight amazing French gardens. I've never seen anything like these gardens before. They were all unique and there is so much to learn from each one. It's 8 a.m. and we're headed to the airport. I am going on a trip all by myself. And the first stop is Amy's house. I'm gonna meet up with her and then we are going together to get on a flight to France. So we're gonna see some friends there and we are going to visit some gardens there. So I'm gonna bring you guys along for the ride. I made it to Maryland and now I am just waiting for my bag. Amy's already here. She's just waiting for me. I am not used to this kind of crowd. This is a very busy airport and hopefully we will get to Amy's house soon. I tried really hard to sleep on the plane on the way because we knew once we got there, it was gonna be eight o'clock in the morning and we weren't gonna go to sleep until way later. And we had two places to visit that day. So this was the first one. And this was honestly one of my very favorite places. Uh, looking back, I really wish we had more time to visit here because we literally spent less than an hour at this castle and potager garden. And it was so beautiful. I tried to get some footage very quickly and I apologize for all of the shaky video. I was traveling super light and had my camera and a small GoPro type camera and then no tripod. I knew that traveling with other people, I would have to capture things pretty quickly because we were trying to visit a lot of places. One of the things that Amy and I noticed right away about this garden is that they are mixing all kinds of plants together. We have flowers, vegetables, fruits, everything is all mixed and they have the ground covered, not so much by mulch, but just by all different kinds of plantings. And another cool thing that we saw was anything can become ornamental. So they have like onions that they let go to seed and it becomes really pretty, these little onion stalks coming up and then the same with kale, they prop them up and make them look like little kale trees. The other cool thing that I noticed is these fruit trees. Underneath them is just these mixed beds of flowers and vegetables and all kinds of stuff. Very permaculture style, but really beautiful. The front area of this garden was all in-ground beds and then once you walk to the back, they had a lot of raised beds and they were just made of wood. Look, look at these cool cold frame windows. Oh. And then there's these little shelf oh. things, I think probably to put it at different levels. Cool. Above the bed. I don't know if that's really true or not, but. See how the, the trunk is right there and then it's just whoop, whoop. And that's all it is, is that level, but that's the fence or the border. Look at how many branches are coming off of it. It's so, so very well done. Yeah, there's a few apples, but not very many. A very common thing that we saw in almost every garden in France was fruit trees. They have so much fruit everywhere. I was so jealous. And you saw earlier the step over apples, the apples that are trained to make a fence. We saw those in almost every garden as well. The other thing I loved about this garden was the trellises. They were super functional, but also really beautiful. I loved some of their natural materials they use, and I definitely want to try some of these in the future. 200, 2,500. Mais on voit que... Gros coton! Excuse moi gros coton! Gros coton! The next garden that we saw was very unique. It was a permaculture farm and unlike anything else that we saw in France, they do classes and events, but they are not open to the public on a daily basis. And the owner, Charles, was so nice to welcome us in and give us a tour, let us take videos and pictures along with uh, one of his apprentices, Constance, she finished up the rest of the tour and showed us around. So it was really cool to be able to hear firsthand what they are doing there 
and why they do it. And yeah. so we were very much inspired by Elliot Coleman. Uh -huh. You probably know yeah. him by John Jevons in California. So we love their work. And we also picked around the world some good practices in Japan, in Korea. And uh, we tried to make a mix all together. Uh, okay. And uh, surprisingly, because we knew nothing at first, surprisingly, it got to be very efficient. Because the first big study we ran, which was from 2011 until 2015, and uh, it showed that uh, we study 1,000 square meters, work 100% by hand, and uh, in, in year three it produces uh, uh, 55,000 euro, so uh, wow. uh, 55 euro per square meter, which yeah. is huge. You know, in France, the uh, average amount with a tractor is three to five euro, yeah. and so uh, that means that. Working by hand, we produce 10 times more, yeah. and so it had a big effect uh, upon uh, organic farmers in France. Yeah, and uh, it inspired a lot uh, many new farms. And yeah. then we wrote this first book, which was produced in the state as uh, Miraculous Abundance, it was produced in many countries of the world. Yeah, and then uh, we run other studies and until now uh, upon the fertility of the oh. soil. It was very interesting because as we uh, grow on a very little surface, mm -hmm. all the rest of the farm can provide organic matter to make compost or mulching. And so we can bring a lot of fertility. And this soil, which were 10 times more productive, um, the fertility in increased very, very fast. So we were storing up to 10% of organic carbon more every year, you know, which is huge. Even yeah. though you were producing a lot, yes. you were storing we a lot. Yes, we produce ten, 10 times more and and meanwhile the fertility increases and we had much more minerals in the soil. Wow. So that was a good news. And the other good news is that if you produce as much on one tenth of hectare as, as on one hectare, it means that you free uh, nine tenths of the hectare, you know, of the surface to plant fruit, fruit trees, forest garden, dig ponds, have animals and all that. Yeah. And so that's very good for biodiversity, which is threatened uh, yeah. quite a lot in Europe. Yeah. And uh, so we have 40 species of wild bees. We have uh, a lot of worms in the soil. We have more than 60 species of birds, uh, including endangered species, yeah. um, make their homes nesting here. here on the farm. Yeah. So. Uh, those studies were showing that uh, we earn more money, uh, we have a good quality of life because it's a nice uh, looking uh, farm, like a big garden, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, it's good for climate, it's good for biodiversity, so everybody wins in, in the story. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. So we work on the resilience of the farm mm -hmm. and we settled a three and a half hectares uh, space there. I can show you, um, where we planted roughly 5,000 fruit trees, we dig a lot of pounds, and um, we could see uh, that year after year there is a microclimate mm. which is starting to develop, so less wind, less heat, more shadow, mm. which is quite exciting, yeah, quite, very quite very nice, nice in, uh, in summer. That's cool. That's it. That's amazing. You have the greenhouse there, which is funny. Because we have a kind of a mini forest in the a mini fruit forest uh, in the greenhouse. We also have chickens in the greenhouse, so they make the compost there. It's beautiful. It's full of perfumes, and we have a very very good figs. Usually they don't grow well, um, uh -huh. this one is a bit Thank green. So the greenhouse was a bit big and so we took advantage of this room for planting mini fruit trees and mm -hmm. we have little pounds, we have quite a lot of flowers also and we can see that uh, the wild bees uh, come more so we have a better pollinization and we scarcely have disease or, or attacks because uh, 
the mixture of many many plants uh, helps to, to to keep the garden in a good health. Underneath all of these trees, it was noticeably cooler, probably 10 degrees cooler underneath them. And then as you moved to other areas of the greenhouse where there wasn't this food forest thing happening, it was super hot. So they had like two different climates inside of this greenhouse. So of course here, everything is done by hand, but uh, the fact of working only with hands allowed to mix the crops so quite often we, we grow two or three vegetables together. Um, a machine can do that. And we try to use it very intensively all year round. This one. Uh -huh. um, this is a place where we store the tools. Yeah, yeah I have but, that one. You know, too. it's very simple tools, but we created one, which is called La Campagnole. Uh, where is it? Here. So this tool was invented here. We took um, Elliot Coleman's uh, system of 80 centimeters wide uh, permanent bed, rest beds, mm -hmm. and uh, we we have been looking for years to to, to prepare the ground uh, fast and efficiently. So this one is just fantastic because it's 80 centimeters, uh, like like the bed, mm -hmm. and uh, we do that. And, and um, the dirt is very fine and nearly ready to, to use, to just uh, use a rake. Wow. And this, this is without fossil fuel, yeah. it's silent, ecological, and it goes very fast, you know. Wow. It goes quite deep, 23 centimeters deep. And uh, as we don't walk on, on, the, on the dirt after, it's very easy to do and very fast. Up. That's great. So that pretty much wraps up our tour here at this permaculture farm and market garden. And if you want to learn more, they do have a couple of books and I will let Charles tell you about them. We have two books which has been introduced in, in the States. Uh, the first one is Miraculous Abundance by uh, Chelsea Green Publishing. And now we have, I, I spent six years writing a huge book in free volume and two of them have has already been published in the States and in England, and it's called Living with the Earth. We had visited those two gardens the first day we arrived, and then we needed to drive four hours after that to go to stay at our friend Gail's house, and we got there so late. It was like 11.30 at night, and we were so tired because I had slept like an hour and a half on the plane. And then mixing that with the jet lag and being pregnant, <laughs> I definitely slept in the next day and then we were able to go and see another garden. Every garden that we visited had a unique set of strengths and things that I learned. One thing that I loved about this garden was all of the natural materials they use for fencing and for borders and for raised beds. It is very common in these potage gardens to see these little mini shrubs as garden borders and they look so good. <laughs> They use a ton of natural materials for raised beds like willow or other kinds of branches that were woven together as well. However, with these particular raised beds, they were high enough off the ground that they also had a metal framing on the inside and then they put the branches woven on the outside just to make it look nice. The other useful thing about the metal is if it wasn't there, then the soil would be touching the branches directly and they would break down pretty fast and I'm sure they don't want to be replacing that every couple of years so having that metal framing there helped them to be able to preserve that beautiful border. This garden also had some crops that were planted more as a display to show how important biodiversity is. They had a very interesting sign that showed the difference between 1950, what the area looked like, and how it had a lot of small farms. And now today it has a lot of larger farms and you could see that. But I can't even imagine what this would look like in certain parts of the US. <laughs> Another thing that Amy and I loved about this place was all of the rosemary that they had. We were sort of just enamored with it. And Gail, our friend was like, why are you guys obsessed with the rosemary? 
And we were saying it's because it doesn't overwinter where we are. It doesn't overwinter where I live, at least. I wish ours were like this, years over winter. Yeah, but ours are not, I mean, they're two years old. You have some next to your house? Yeah, the ones next to our house are two years old. I hope they become a bush like that sometime. Yeah. But yeah, that'd be cool if they were that big. You know, like one trunk. You know what I mean? They're not letting it do whatever it wants to do. Oh, okay. They're pruning it like Yeah, they're pruning bush. it to be just like everything else. One mm -hmm. trunk with a nice top. I really need to write that down too. I, I see it here and I'm like, oh, do that, do that, do that. Try that. My last takeaway from this garden was seeing how much emphasis they put on the fruits and the flowers and the vegetables were sort of like a backdrop. They were not the, at the forefront, which is different than my own goals. Like we're doing things more for production but I would love to add a little bit more beauty in my own garden. Today we're visiting an abbey and they have medicinal herb gardens here. At one point in our trip, Amy and I were having a conversation about what makes these French potager gardens so beautiful and so unique. And one of the conclusions we came to was it was all about the stone walls and what a beautiful backdrop they made. Unless you already have a stone wall in your backyard, this would definitely be something that would be hard to mimic on a home scale. So we just got to enjoy looking at them, but realized that it's not practical to put one of those up. Probably a lot more practical to do like a row of hedges around a garden instead. For this garden, they have individual squares and each one is filled with herbs and then they have each of them labeled for what it is plus the medicinal use. All of it's in French, so I have to go home and translate all these later, but it's pretty cool. This is more Amy's thing. She loves the uh, how herbs are used for medicine and all of that. I have not gotten that into it yet. One of the things that really struck me about this medicinal herb garden, and this is probably because I have done so little with using herbs for medicine, just like a very small amount. So the thing that struck me was how many of these herbs and plants I was familiar with, and I didn't know that they had a medicinal use. So I have a ton of these things in my garden, but I didn't know that they could be used medicinally. So that was pretty cool to realize and to see I actually have a book in my house all about using herbs for medicine, but as you can tell, I have not even hardly cracked it open yet. So this definitely piqued my interest and I will probably be looking more into that in the future. It was really eye-opening. The next couple of gardens we were going to visit were in the Loire Valley which was south. So we drove there and we were super excited because our friends Gail and Roseanne joined us. Gail and Roseanne are sisters and they lived with us at different times as exchange students for a year. When they were in high school, I was quite a bit younger, but Amy and Gail are the same age and Amy actually was the one to spend a year in France first. So that's why she's fluent in French. Anyways, so that made the trip a lot more fun for us to be able to visit with them and also be able to see the gardens and castles at the same time. The first chateau we went to was Chambord and it was so busy. We were there right during their busiest season, this mid-August time frame. It's when everybody is still on vacation. So it was very crowded and I don't like crowds, so it was not my favorite, but the castle itself was very pretty and um, very popular, apparently. As far as the outside of the castle goes, from above, all of the formal gardens were really pretty, but the thing was, once we got close to the formal gardens, we were actually really kind of disappointed in how they looked up close. A lot of things were diseased, it didn't look like things were being taken care of, and Amy and I were joking like, where is the gardener that is supposed to be working on this? And there was this robot <laughs> lawnmower that was going around. So we found a little robot gardener, but it wasn't doing a very good job on the other plants. 
There were still a couple of things here that were unique and pretty cool to look at. One was how they had their apple trees trained to these trellises that were like little pyramids, a very structural thing. And it was cool. I'd never seen anything like that before. After we were done in this area, there was a potage at this castle that we went over to go see. As we were walking in there, I noticed two things. One, there was a gardener present, and two, it was being very well kept up, and it looked so beautiful. I was just like, sort of like a jaw drop moment. Like, this is so much better than their formal gardens. They were charging a lot of money to see the castle in the formal gardens, and yet here was this potage, the best thing that we had seen so far, and we ran into a problem. So we are at the potage at this castle, but this is the coolest part of the whole experience and they have a sign that says you can't go in there. So that's kind of a bummer. They used to offer tours for the potage garden, but they don't do that anymore. And I would have gladly paid just for the potage garden tour and that's it and not seen anything else. The castle, it was okay. It was pretty cool, but the potager garden was awesome and just the fact that I couldn't like get in there and see things. There was a whole other section of the potager garden that was behind a stone wall, I think, and we couldn't see any of that either. So I would have just loved to be able to like get a little bit closer, but I tried to take as many videos and pictures as I could from where we were standing. We did talk to the gardener there too. He was super nice. Very knowledgeable guy, obviously knew what he was doing. It was very apparent. What I really like about it is like, it has the shape, you know, like a cool shape in the middle. Yeah. But then, you know, it's, what bothered me before about having the formal gardens is that you get all these weird shaped beds. Yeah. So you only have this one here. That's weird. And then the rest are all like square and more useful. Well, and, the, and the back of the circle is square. Right, so it's not like the circle continues right here. It's a square. Yes, just yeah, a that's circle true. At the that's front. true. And then there's the mat, some kind of woolly. Yeah, it's definitely not mat. It's not using plastic for that. It's using. What is that? I wish we could ask. I don't know. So from the outside looking in, I loved the usefulness of this garden. I love how it had like a really nice balance of flowers and fruits and vegetables and it seemed also very productive too. That afternoon we visited one more castle and all of the gardens surrounding it and that was Shinan So. The setting of this castle and gardens was definitely one of the most picturesque we had seen. It has a middle bridge that leads to the castle and on each side is a garden. One is the garden of, it's Diane de Poitier on one side and on the other side is Catherine de Medicis. And each of those was a very formal garden. We saw the inside of many of the castles. Obviously my main purpose for being there was not the castle, it was the garden. But this castle actually has some pretty cool interior design things that I felt like I could take back and apply at home. And that's the reason why I liked uh, this castle and certain gardens over other gardens is just because like if I could see things that I could apply back at our house and utilize later then I was like oh, okay yeah this is useful to me it's nice to be able to like observe pretty gardens but for me like my purpose was I want to be able to find things that I want to implement at home in my own home and in my own garden and the castle and the gardens here definitely check those boxes and I was able to find a lot of things that I thought would be really cool to be able to try at home. They also had a really nice flower garden here that is what they termed it was the flower garden but really it was actually mostly vegetables some flowers but a really nice design throughout. At this point, we had seen enough potager gardens that I was seeing some common threads happening between all of these gardens. And one of those was some type of beautiful fencing. So sometimes it was fruit trees that were trained to a fence. Other times it was hedges. And then 
like I said before, one of the most beautiful we loved was the stone walls around each garden. Another thing that was common among all of these potager gardens is they were designed in such a way that it was just as beautiful to look at from above, from a bird's eye view, as from the ground. And they always add flowers throughout the whole garden. So it's not like they're just adding flowers in one row or in one place. You can see flowers in certain places of the entire garden. And they were using annual flowers and perennial flowers. So you would see like sunflowers, but they also had a lot of rose bushes that are perennials that just come up year after year to add some beauty there. And the last thing that I noticed among all of these potager gardens is that they always add shrubs inside of every single garden, whether it's on corners and they're shaped in a certain way or as garden bed edges or as borders for the whole garden. They are utilized all the time. Amy told us that she was trying to save the best for last and that is Chateau Villandry, the gardens here are unlike any other and I had seen pictures of them before so I kind of knew what we were walking into but seeing it in person is a whole different experience. Villandry has a lot of different garden areas. This one is the ornamental kitchen garden. I have never seen a vegetable garden like this before. It was so pristine. It was almost surreal, this whole garden and the design of it. Within the kitchen garden, there are nine garden areas that are identical in size, but each one had a different geometric design. And the cool thing about the gardens here is outside each of the gardens, they had like a little key where you could see what they were growing in all of the garden beds. And it wasn't just, here is celery. It was like, here's celery and here's the variety of celery that we're growing. So that was super cool. This garden also has a couple of areas where you can't go all the way into the gardens. They have gates around each of the garden squares so that people aren't walking all the way through and stepping on plants. But at least with this one, I can walk all the way around the square and be able to see everything. Whereas the other one, we could not even get close to a bunch of the plants. Okay, I'm at a different garden square here. Again, step over apples, some ornamental plantings. And then in here we have celery. Then this is all boxwoods. And then we have some ornamental kale. I spent a lot of time walking around and looking at all of these vegetables in the garden, but during this time I noticed a very distinctive smell and I was like, I know what that is. That is the smell of fish emulsion fertilizer. So I, I did see a gardener actually pouring it into some of the plants, but I think they were running it through their drip lines as well because you could smell it throughout this entire vegetable garden. So. Just so you know, that's what they were using for fertilizer. After visiting the vegetable gardens, if you walk up a flight of stairs, then you can see all of these more ornamental garden areas. In this area, this is where we found all of the gardeners. They have a team of 10 gardeners that works full time to maintain and preserve the gardens at V Laundry. How do they sweep it up with all the gravel? I was thinking the same thing and not get it to like, you know, compost and then there's weeds in it. And... Yep. Another thing I loved up on this second terrace is right as you walk up the stairs from the vegetable garden, there is a grape arbor that extends from one side all the way to the other side of the garden and it provided a bunch of shade. It was so nice and cool under there and it also looked just amazing. I really want to replicate this trellising that they have for the grapes, but maybe for something else. But I just wanted to notice that there's wood and then there's metal here and they have, I think those are, yes, metal 
wires going all the way down this way. There are a lot of different levels that separate the gardens, so I walked up a set of stairs from the vegetable gardens to get to the ornamental gardens, and then at the back of that, there is a ramp that you can walk up and go to what's called the water garden, and then they also have the sun garden up in this area. When I walked into the sun garden, I saw a bunch of different pathways through it, and then if you go through that, that's when you get to the actual part that looks like a sun. They have pathways that extend out. And if you look at it from above, it looks like sun rays. So that's why they call it the sun garden. So far we visited the more formal gardens and now I am up in what's called the sun garden. This is a lot more organic looking and they just have a lot of plants to keep the ground covered. I really like it. It has all these little pathways that you can go through and everything is just all kinds of variations of sizes and shapes, colors, textures, and it's just really, really pretty. I'd love to have like a little garden like this in my backyard. This one's a little bit more, I would say a lot more practical than the big formal garden that's here at Villandry. I spent a lot of time up in the sun garden just getting videos and pictures because there were a lot of good ideas. And then after visiting the sun garden, I went over to the herb garden. If you guys remember, we already visited a garden that was full of herbs and medicinal plants when we went to the abbey. So even though this one was very pretty and slightly different, I actually didn't spend too much time up here. Most of the time was spent in the vegetable garden and just really enjoying the sun garden as well. We got to Villandry as soon as they opened at like 9 o'clock in the morning. So the first thing that we did was we went to go and see the gardens because it was much cooler in the day at that time and it was a lot less busy. Once we were finished touring the gardens, that is when we went over and toured the castle. It was kind of funny because I was looking back at the videos that I took of the castle and I probably took like two videos and every other video I just walked to the window and I would look out and get <laughs> uh, views of the garden. That's all I really cared about. <laughs> there was so much to see at Villandry. We all ended up kind of splitting in different ways and just looking at things and for a long time I was just by myself and then we went to the castle together and after we were done at the castle, Amy was like, did you get to see the greenhouses? And I was like, what greenhouses? So we went over and looked at the greenhouses and that was the last thing that we did at V Laundry. In this area, they had a bunch of seedlings that they were getting ready to transplant for the fall. And I was really amazed because even their little seedlings were so organized by color and they were all spaced out very evenly. <laughs> The potager at Chateau Colbert was the last garden that we visited and this one was different from all of the others because Chateau Colbert is like a luxury hotel and they also have a restaurant and then they have this potager garden. We were able to get a tour of this garden from the head gardener and an apprentice and he just kept talking about how a lot of the things that they grow in this garden are for the hotel customers or for those who eat in the restaurant. A lot of the vegetables and flowers that are produced, those go up to the restaurant and the hotel. Toute l'année oh, au jardin. Oh. Donc là, vite, pour retourner. The, the hotel visitors and the restaurant visitors have free access to the garden. Okay. So they're all year round making sure it looks oh, nice. nice. The head gardener didn't speak very much English and I don't understand enough French so Amy spent a lot of time translating so I could understand a lot of what he was saying with the tour. And currants, tout ça c'est utilisé pour le restaurant. We use all of it for the restaurant. The currants, the chives. Uh, do you measure and track how much you produce? Two, two tonnes. 4,000 pounds, it's, yeah. it's aesthetic first, yeah. and then production second. Flower, yeah, uh -huh. every day. 
for the last right. every day, day, every day. Uh, uh -huh. This is a uh, vert. Oui, okay, yeah. super. Yeah. Mm. C'est quoi ça? Uh, moutarde. Moutarde. Okay. Uh, mustard. Yeah, mustard greens. Okay. Mm. This. Well, we don't usually do this one. This is very interesting. What? It, what does that translate to? Phacelia. It's the same in English. P H A C E L I A. Fréquence. Vous ajoutez ça au. une une fois par. Once, once a year you're okay. adding a layer, like this much compost to each bed. Uh, once a month you turn yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Six, eight months. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, really beautiful. Second variety. Agria. Agria. Pour la purée. Um, to make uh, yeah. mashed potatoes. Yeah. Agria. Ça uh, c'est très très ferme. Okay. Ouais. What kind is this variety? Rat. 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 Air. It's very expensive. Very expensive. Uh, because. Um, Ça en, en petit, petit size, small, right. Right. It's uh, very big. This, this one. This is big. Yeah. Yeah. Usually they're very small. Mm -hmm. As we were going through the garden tour, the gardener kept giving us little samples of things to eat along the way and one of those things was a strawberry and then we had some blackberries and some of the raspberries as well and every single one of them was the best I had ever had in my life. It was so good. If we were there a little bit longer, I would have loved to eat at the restaurant. I believe it's reservation only, but with how good these were just as they were i can't even imagine what a chef would do to all of these vegetables and fruits it would be so worth it to go there so this was another garden that let a lot of the plants go to seed for beauty and then they could also save the seeds or they just let the seeds fall in place and then those same vegetables would pop up there the next year one of the things that we saw was kale. Another thing that we saw was fennel. First year? Uh, okay. The first year. In, yeah. the, uh, in the winter cut here. Uh-huh. And uh, a, new, a new plant next year. Yeah. We just cut it at the bottom and it will be bigger next year. Uh -huh. uh, after three, three years. Uh, it makes a little tree. <laughs> wow, that's huge. Up on the hillside is where they had all of their fruit trees. They had peaches and apples, pears. They even had some kiwi plants up there, but they said they had never produced yet because they were still pretty young. Pear don't seem to like no. to be tiny. It's hard on them and, um, and uh, here the soil is mainly uh, sable, uh, sand. sand. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't retain water uh -huh. and uh, like a little bit of water. <laughs> yeah, it's too dry. <laughs> so it's too dry, yeah. Uh, they, they were beautiful uh, until a month ago. Yeah. But uh, now we are in summer. Mm -hmm. It's getting too hot. Yes. And oh. they lost the trees already. Mm -hmm. uh, every year there is one, two, three mm -hmm. a day. Mm -hmm. In this garden, there was a lot of variety, a lot of diversity, a lot of mixed plantings. And it was so fun to be able to get a tour of this place and visit and a really good ending to all of our garden tours. On our last day, we did a little bit of sightseeing as we drove back to Paris to catch our flight. And then for me, it was a two-day trip home. First day, getting back to Amy's house and then finally one more day of getting back to my house. <laughs> After 12 days away, I was so excited to be home again and start to put all of the things that I learned into practice.